We are, uh, so it's Morris HVAC. We're located out of Ipswich. Um, we have loads of people. Uh, I'm not here to sell you. Um, Tom did mention something, which is don't wait until everything fails. We always get tons of failures on the hottest day, hottest week of the year, coldest week of the year. Um, plan ahead if you can. It will help you and it will help us. Um, all right, so I wanted to get into a couple things. So the basics here, and this is sort of um, geared based on questions that we get from customers after installations. Um, so the two things that are, that are the slides will kind of gear towards is one is how is the heat pump going to be used or installed based on the different um, heating systems that you might currently have in your own house. Um, and then two, which I've been getting a lot, a lot of questions lately is what's it going to cost to operate? Um, not necessarily cost to install. You can get a quote from me, you can get a quote from anybody, but what's it going to cost to operate? Um, and I think people want to, want to understand that. Um, and it does vary quite a bit. So Tom was talking about efficiency. Um, there's something we call, call coefficient, coefficient of performance, which Tom was mentioning, the number three. So three times is a good number for a heat pump for the whole season. So your heating season starts in, say, October, and it ends in, say, April. It, over the course of that, heat, that season, an air source heat pump outside will be about three times as efficient as um, electric baseboard heat. Um, What's, what that's going to mean is when it's warm, it's 55 degrees outside, you need a little bit of heat in October, it's going to be like four times as efficient. When it's really cold outside and it's eight degrees, it's going to be much less efficient. That's when you get down to 1.5, 1.75, something like that. It has to work a lot harder, has to generate a lot more heat. Over the course of the season, you're using it the whole time, it will average itself out. Um, that's what I'm saying down here, outdoor temperature does matter. Um, there's a couple two, a couple metrics that I want you to think about. The number of heating hours is something that's important. Um, we have something called design temperature. I have down here five degrees. So in this area, 99% of the hours that uh, any heating system will be operating, the temperature is above five degrees. 1% um, of the heating hours is below that. So we had a minus 10 day or something like that this year. Um, that's way outside of anyone's realm of, of planning for it. Uh, we don't design around those temperatures. So you can kind of throw that out. The other thing is 32 degrees. So roughly about half of the heating hours in our area are above freezing. And then roughly half are below freezing. Um, and that's important when we get into partial home uh, installations. So I will move on. All right. Um, so for the next thing, so three ways that we're really installing heat pumps right now. Number one is dual fuel. So who in here has um, forced air system, a, a hot air furnace with ductwork? OK. Um, do you have a AC on that system? Yeah, does anyone not have AC? Okay. So, all right, so you might have ductwork. Um, if you, when the time comes to replace the furnace, you have two options. You can get rid of the furnace, or we can do what's called dual fuel. You can keep the furnace in place. We put in an, a heat pump outside with a coil on top of the furnace, refrigerant line that connects them. Most commonly, this is going to be, we're going to have a dual fuel control, which is just a thermostat. I mean, Ecobee thermostat, something like that, a smart thermostat. And what we can do with that is we can run the heat pump when it's warmer outside. And then when it gets below 30, which is the temperature that mass save says, then we're going to run the backup heat. You're going to run the, the, uh, the furnace. Yep. Is that eligible for the mass save? Yes. So partial home. Dual fuel systems are partial home. And with any of these systems, uh, the heat pump itself has to be rated. And so there's, mass save has a rating system. Um, and so we would spec only a, a system that's uh, efficient enough. Um, and so what you have to do with, if you have, if your source of fuel is natural gas or oil, we have to lock out the, the furnace above 30. And if it's propane, it's five degrees. We have to lock out the, fur the furnace above five. Um, two other ways, so heat pumps. So you might have, um, there are some in this area where we have a heat pump with an electric strip heater. So um, using it for air conditioning, it's a heat pump that runs. And then when it starts to get cold, there's an electric heater, resistance heater that comes on. They're pretty, tip they're pretty typically very expensive to operate, um, though usually those heat pumps don't operate down as cold. Um, what we could do in this scenario is put you on something more efficient. Um, and then on the bottom where we're talking primary heat with no backup, there are a couple of different kinds of heat pumps. Old traditional heat pumps, the, they sort of stop running as the temp drops. Now there are new, uh, newer, uh, we call them low ambient, or hyperheat is technically a Mitsubishi 
Um, I believe it's a trademark term. Uh, but basically what they'll do is they'll give you 100% of their capacity all the way down to zero degrees roughly, and they'll keep running even when it's 20 degrees below zero. You'll still be getting heat out of the system. Um, so these are all different ways that we can um, heat your house with a heat pump. All right, let's see. We do get this question. Will it keep my house warm? So um, yeah, if you have an older home, um, old ductwork, you'll go down the basement, um, we saw it all the time, oil furnaces, you know, they would just kind of get really hot and heat would just kind of walk up, walk, waft its way up through the, through the house. Um, usually the ductwork's not sealed, it's not insulated. Um, in a scenario like that, you're best to have it sealed, best to have it insulated. Sometimes it's cost prohibitive or it's built into walls. Um, in those scenarios, you're most likely gonna need backup heat. So I would say, maybe for you, for financial purposes, let's take whole home off the table and let's really think about partial home. It makes more sense in certain scenarios. Um, and as I'm saying here, still greener than doing nothing because if we can hit half the heating hours, we can get rid of that and put it on a heat pump. That's great, right? Emissions reduction. Um, so with a boiler, Tom was talking about hydronic systems. So anytime you have a boiler, you have baseboards, you have uh, radiators, that's a hydronic system. Um, typically in that scenario, we're gonna be doing mini splits. You don't have any ductwork in the house. Um, mini splits can be done in individual rooms. You can do one for the main floor. You can do them all over the house. Um, loads of different options. And we'll get into this. So, okay, so this is number one. So for the scenario, for those of you, um, somebody with an, a gas furnace and currently has AC, what can we do? Time to replace both. It's an older home, so maybe the home's not super efficient. What can we do? Really simple. Um, if you want to keep the furnace, we can put in a heat pump. We can put in a new coil. We can find a new match. If you want to replace the whole system, find a match for the whole system. Really simple. We do it all the time. It takes a couple of days. You're using the existing ductwork. Um, as we say in the bottom, a heat pump does cost more than an AC. Um, so if you were to you know, just swap out the AC, say, hey, my AC died, I need a new one. Yeah, a heat pump's going to cost you a little bit more. But if we can get you a higher efficiency product that you're then going to get a rebate, you'll actually net out cheaper. So in a scenario here, it almost always makes sense to just go at least into dual fuel. Yeah. Basic question. Yeah. Heat pumps always provide heat and AC? Yes. Okay, so we're, we're talking a lot about heat, but they also provide AC. Yes. By default, every heat pump will, will do air conditioning. All it is, it's got a thing called a reversing valve, and it just the system runs in reverse. Um, and I'm trying to go a little quick to get to some Q&A, but yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So as Tom was saying, it, it's it's moving. So it it's it's pulling heat out of one source and moving it to another. So in in summertime, it's pulling heat out of your out of the air inside your house. It's using the refrigerant. So it's sending refrigerant inside and outside. Uh, it's pulling heat out of that air and dispelling it outside. So, all right, number two, you have a boiler. This is very common in this, this um, in uh, Hamilton, kind of all over the North Shore. You have a boiler, some, at some point you put in air conditioning in the second floor of the house to get the bedrooms because it was always super hot in the summer. Um, so what can you do in this scenario if you want to put in a heat pump? That you can replace the air handler up in the attic, use the ductwork that's there. We can put a heat pump outside. Um, on the first floor, you can do mini splits on the walls. Right? You don't have ductwork for the first floor, so that's a good option. That can heat your first floor. We do that all the time, very common. Um, depending on some calculations that we can do and you know, discussions, the size of the equipment, quality of the ductwork, it may be possible to have that qualify for a whole home rebate, um, or at least it would be a partial home rebate. Um, there's some things that we'd have to do with controls, and we could always have those discussions with everybody, uh, but it is an option. Um, and then number three... Yeah, so this is the, for anyone with a boiler. So anyone have a boiler with no air conditioning? Yeah, so we got plenty of you. Um, yeah, super common. So um, we get the, the, the question a lot, can, can I put in a heat pump and replace my boiler and actually use the radiators or, or baseboards in my house? Bottom line, like right now, no. Um, the technology's not here. There's some stuff in Europe that might come later and we can get to that point. It's all low temperature water. So you'd be thinking about replacing the baseboard. You can leave it, you can leave it for emergencies. The best option here, as, as Tom sort of talked about, is typically what we're gonna do is mini splits. Um, you could go and you could put ductwork throughout the whole house. If it's feasible, that certainly increases the cost quite a bit. Um, but in this scenario, we think about mini splits. Um, sometimes you can target one or two small rooms with uh, short pieces of ductwork or something like that in an air handler. 
Um, but, uh, you know, this, this is basically your sort of number one mini split application, uh, particularly in this area. Um, and we can get into, for those with boilers, who's on a gas boiler? Okay, so maybe half. Who's on an oil boiler? Okay, yeah, propane boiler, anyone? No, okay, fine. Um, all right, so we'll get, into, we'll get into cost on some of that stuff next. Um, all right, so now with heat pumps, there's a couple things that we get questions a lot, how to use it. Um, so one thing people do with their heating systems a lot, the boilers, the furnaces, you know, you set it way back overnight, you go upstairs, you sleep at night, and you set the downstairs to 50, and then you want to turn it back up in the morning. You might program your thermostat, let, you know, let it warm up. Um, so with heat pumps, what that's going to do is that's going to make that compressor run really hard, and that's when they're the least efficient. So you want to have much more of a kind of stable temperature, more of a set and forget as much as you can. Um, new current heat pumps have modulating compressors. They can ramp all the way down and just kind of go in low. The fans will actually run all the time if you have mini splits. They just like to run on really low temps, um, on really low settings. Um, and then for number two, this is really just sort of general application. All new equipment is meant to run longer. You're meant to have long run times Almost everyone's boiler or furnace in their house right now, if it's more than 10 years old, is probably way oversized. Um, so most likely we're going to any, you know, if we come and install something for you, we're sizing it down. It's going to run longer. Um, it's much better for the equipment and it's much more comfortable in the house. Um, and I, I, I circled on my own notes the, the, the bottom one here, which Morgan was just talking about. So um, typically here, and I, and I, I will have some slides to this. Um, Heating loads and cooling loads in current in new houses, new construction houses, are actually pretty similar. Um, so heat pumps work great. They can do the same amount of heating as they can cooling. Um, in older homes, typically what we see is that heating loads are much higher. So you might have a heating load that's two times the amount of the cooling load. And what we say by load is the amount of sort of BTUs, we get into a whole bunch of stuff that you need. Um, but so what we'd like to do is to make the you can put in a, a heat pump that's sized more properly for your home and more likely that you can do the whole home and actually replace your system is get that home more efficient, basically. Do everything that you possibly can to lower the heating load. So air sealing is huge. Insulating is huge. Um, find a good contractor who does it. We don't do that right now, um, but find a good one who does it. Make sure that they're diligent. Stay on top of them when they're there. They're doing tons of them. Um, but you know, make sure that they spend the time to do it properly. Because what you really want to do is, as much of that load that you can reduce, you're going to lower the amount of heat that you need. You'll, low, you'll lower the emissions that you use, um, and it will cost you less. So OK. All right, um, regarding the mass saves. So yeah, number one for us is don't design a system just to get the rebate. Um, come talk to us. Talk to any contractor, whoever you want to use. Um, talk to them about what you want to do. You know, um, I need to replace my boiler. I really want to do this. Um, I really want to get a heat pump for X, Y, or Z reasons. These are the parts of the home that we're going to be living in all the time. These are the parts of the home that my kids went off to college and we can keep the rooms really, really low temperature, you know, except for twice a year, something like that, right? These are important things that we as an installer need to know that so that when we design the system, um, we can make sure that it works for you. Um, uh, yeah, and then, so now for some of you that might have heat pumps, you've installed mini splits over the course of the last 10 years or something like that. Um, and I know I, I spoke to someone in the audience about this. It does, the, the, the rebate does actually only apply to new equipment. So if you want to do a whole home rebate, it's only for something new. So if you already have a heat pump in there, you should think about the next step is partial home rebate. You can continue to use that. Um, the second one, so um, I talk to electricians all the time and, and customers who get confused sometimes. Um, we're definitely, these, these systems run electricity. And if they're generating heat, uh, usually it's a 40 amp circuit to a 60 amp circuit. Um, so you should know about your electrical panel first. Like I know our, our uh, salespeople come and, and take a look at the panel and you have that discussion first. Um, the amount for $5,000 for an electrical upgrade, we talk, I actually talked to MassSave today. Um, if you do the heat loan, that is, you can finance an electrical service upgrade up to 5000 And actually, 5000 is a pretty good number for what it will cost um, for an overhead service upgrade, uh, say 100 amps to 200 amps um, in this area. Uh, OK, so now we get into cost. So I get this all the time. Heat pumps are so efficient. You know, it's going to be like free to operate. Um, and now we are starting here from what I'm not including in any of this analysis is solar. Um, solar is great. I love it. Um, 
put, put panels on your house, you know, um, net meter, it's great. Uh, what, what I wanted to do is give you guys a realistic operating cost for um, current electricity rates um, and the way that the equipment operates. You can figure out how much solar you can generate and, and what, what rate you can sell it back to the utilities at. Um, and then you can kind of net that out. So these are some things, something to think about for, for how efficient homes are now versus what they used to be, and something for you to think about the age of your own home and how efficient it really is. So um, on the left here, I have some um, you know, scenarios where you had a house with no insulation, single pane windows. Think about a house built in 1920, you know, something like that, um, where you haven't had a major renovation to it. That's where you're gonna be. Um, that's about three times the heating load of a house built now uh, for the same square footage. Um, then you have a couple of different scenarios. Most common is this sort of two by four walls insulated. We have double pane windows. You maybe do replacement windows somewhere over the years. Um, new construction is even lower than this now because the code keeps getting harder and harder and harder uh, to, to achieve. So on the right, these are two for two customers that I did recently. Um, I got them to send me their utility bills and we, I took a look at their actual gas usage. Um, so the one, number one is a home built in 2016 has a spray foam, you know, R39 roof or something like that, air sealed really well. Um, they do, uh, it's a big house. They do um, heat and hot water with, uh, with gas and they use 118 therm. So a therm is a measure of, um, of gas use. And then home number two is built in 1920, small house. Um, and they used almost three times as much energy and the house is less than half the size. So, um, Older homes, it's going to be harder to achieve that kind of a, of a, when we need to generate that much heat with a heat pump, it's going to be more difficult than in an older home. Um, and in a new home, it's super easy. Okay, so we get into cost per BTU. So does anyone know what BTU is? British thermal unit. British thermal unit, yeah. Just think of it as a measure of heat. Um, so an easy way to do this is to kind of look at everything on the same basis, depending on which kind of fuel you have. So here I have, and I should have made it bigger. You guys were right. Uh, so we have a gas furnace or a boiler, 95% efficient. We have heat pumps, and then we have oil boiler, propane uh, furnace or a boiler, and then electric resistance heat. Um, what I did here for a heat pump is I put in two rates. Um, Hamilton has a really great rate. You guys are lucky. Uh, so you guys negotiated, I guess, with Mass Save three years ago. And you've been paying, yeah, electricity rate. You've been paying about 25 cents a kilowatt hour, which three years ago was about National Grid's um, local rate. Uh, right now, this past winter, National Grid was at 48 cents. They, they, set, um, they set the supply rate up 60% back in November, and so rates are really high. So here, for a million BTUs, roughly, with a gas boiler or a furnace, 22.50 to generate a million BTUs. With a heat pump in Hamilton, 25 bucks. With a heat pump anywhere else in National Grid's territory, about 45 bucks. Um, so, which is very comparable to propane or oil. Uh, so as Tom is saying, uh, yes, you might save some money versus propane and oil. Right now it's not gonna happen versus um, gas. Very, very close in Hamilton though. Um, but we'll get there, that, that will most likely change at some point. Um, yeah, and we don't know the rate yet, right? Exactly, so they'll renegotiate the rate. Um, National Grid did just drop their rates for the summer, and we'll get to this later, but um, we'll see if that sticks. Um, so this is just something for like a month. Um, so if anyone has natural gas, you, you probably know what your monthly utility bill is. Um, you know, this is just a scenario where someone was paying $275 a month in, in natural gas. Um, what would that cost if you were on a heat pump? Um, and you can look at it if you're, if you're on oil. Say you had $500 a month on, in oil in, in the winter. You know, what would that cost you on a heat pump? Um, so it's just a couple scenarios. Again, the, the net of it is right now pretty comparable to propane and oil at the current national grid rates. Um, uh, natural gas is going to be cheaper. But again, emissions for heat pump way lower. Okay, this is as rates change, we kind of, um, so again, this is Hamilton. Now what I have here with the, the different efficiencies for the heat pump is again, it's more of that seasonal kind of a thing. So in this scenario, you might, when the heat pump's more efficient at three and a half, that's gonna be in the fall. You're not gonna need as many BTUs in that kind of a month either, right? So um, you're gonna have a lower bill. 
over the course of the season, you might have something in the middle. And then in the coldest months of the year, you're going to have the efficiency is going to be a little lower. You need to generate more heat. That's when your bills will go higher. So with a heat pump, you're going to see um, probably more seasonal fluctuation um, than you would with sort of oil or uh, natural gas uh, utility bills. Some things to think about. All right, so yeah, so number one, um, <clears throat> more likely to save money if you're on electric resistance. Does anyone have electric resistance through their whole house anymore? No, okay, sometimes there's, yeah, nobody. You're all lucky. Um, or if you're on heating oil or propane, you will have some savings. You'll definitely have savings in the fall and the spring. And then depending on what happens with rates, um, if rates go back to where they were, electricity rates go back to where they were a year ago, then the heat pump is, is a good bit cheaper. Um, it just really depends, and that's sort of up to natural grid at the moment. Um, again, number two, we always get calls in January when it was like 10 degrees for, you know, 10 degree low for, for five days in a row. Um, and people say, oh, it cost me so much. Um, that's what happens. Um, you know, heat pumps are then, they need to generate the most heat. They're operating at their lowest efficiency, so they'll be more expensive in those months. But it will average out, and in the, in the little bit warmer months, they'll, they'll be much more efficient and cost much less to operate. Um, number three, again, right now, I'm just trying to be, I like to be upfront with everybody. If you're on, if you have a natural gas system right now, um, I can't really save you money on an operating cost basis right now. Um, rates may change in the future. Um, renewables will come on eventually and electricity rates will drop. So think about the lifetime of the equipment, how long you think it will take for that stuff to happen. Um, and we can all obviously have those discussions. Um, number four, make that house efficient. That will help you. Five, solar helps a ton. And six is that scenario for the people who have kids in college and don't need to heat the whole house. You know, there, there are some great options, particularly with mini splits, where we can say, you know, let's heat the living room and the kitchen area really well, and we can let the other, the other parts of the home um, be cooler, and we can save money that way. So mini splits have all different sizes. Um, Generally, the smallest size is uh, 6,000 BTUs, which would be for a, um, I mean, honestly, that'll do like pretty much any bedroom, um, except for a very, like a large master bedroom. Sometimes they're even too big for small bedrooms. Um, but if it's done well and the other units are designed fine, then that application works really well. Um, and then they can go up to, so they have different kinds. As Tom was saying earlier, there's wall units. There's ones that kind of come and are meant to sort of replace radiators. They're called console units or floor mount units, ones that go in the ceiling. Um, and uh, they vary in size, you know, up to sort of, you can get ones that are 36,000 BTUs for a single unit. Um, so this is a little bit about the electricity rates. Has anyone heard about the national grid sort of electricity rates and all the uproar that happened in, yeah, in November. Yeah, so right. I don't know how it was allowed and how they got, who, who, who let them pass that increase, um, but the increase came back down. I would probably expect, it seems like they're gonna try to do this every year, right? Have a, have a winter rate that's, that's higher than a summer rate. Um, we'll have to just see what they do. Um, you know, us as a company, it's something that we like to try to keep an eye on to talk to people, um, but, uh, you know, what I'd say here, yes, it does impact the cost efficiency, um, but let's think about the long term here, right? Um, you know, we're already talking about solar can help you offset um, things like community solar, utility scale projects, wind coming on. Um, I keep hearing about all the, the um, hydro projects that are gonna come into play. I don't know enough about it. Um, but so the, the net there is, um, yes, heat pumps are very high efficiency. That doesn't always mean that they're gonna be really low cost. Um, you got to think about what the alternative is, what the other source of fuel is, and then the rate that you're paying. 